on the new heavens and the new earth. 2 Peter 3, verse 13 Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. There is a limit to the revelations of the Bible about futurity, and it were a mental or spiritual trespass to go beyond it. The reserve which it maintains in its informations, we also ought to maintain in our inquiries. Satisfied to know little on every subject where it has communicated little, and feeling our way into regions which are, at present, unseen, no further than the light of Scripture will carry us. But while we attempt not to be wise above that which is written, we should attempt, and that most studiously, to be wise up to that which is written. The disclosures are very few and very partial, which are given to us of that bright and beautiful economy, which is to survive the ruins of our present one. But still there are such disclosures, and on the principle of the things that are revealed belonging unto us, we have a right to walk up and down, for the purpose of observation over the whole actual extent of them. What is made known of the details of immortality is but small in the amount nor are we furnished with the materials of anything like a graphical or picturesque exhibition of its abodes of blessedness. But still somewhat is made known, and which, too, may be addressed to a higher principle than curiosity, being like every other scripture, profitable both for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness. The text before us, there are two leading points of information which we should like successively to remark upon. The first is that in the new economy, which is to be reared for the accommodation of the blessed, there will be materialism, not merely new heavens, but also a new earth. The second is that as distinguished from the present, which is an abode of rebellion, it will be an abode of righteousness. First, we know, historically, that earth, that a solid material earth, may form the dwelling of sinless creatures, in full converse and friendship with the being who made them, that instead of a place of exile for outcasts, it may have a broad avenue of communication with the spiritual world for the descent of ethereal beings from on high, that, like the number of an extended family, it may share in the regard and attention of the other members, and along with them be gladdened by the presence of him who is the father of them all. To inquire how this can be were to attempt a wisdom beyond Scripture. But to assert that this has been, and therefore may be, is to keep most strictly and modestly within the limits of the record. For we there read that God framed an apparatus of materialism, which, in his own surveying, he pronounced to be all very good, and the leading features of which may still be recognized among the things and the substances that are around us, and that he created man with the bodily organs and senses which we now wear, and placed him under the very canopy that is over our heads, and spread around him a scenery, perhaps lovelier in its tints, and more smiling and serene in the whole aspect of it, but certainly made up, in the main, of the same objects that still compose the prospect of our visible contemplations. And there, working with his hands in a garden, and with trees on every side of him, and even with animals sporting at his feet, was this inhabitant of earth, in the midst of all those earthly and familiar accompaniments, in full possession of the best immunities of a citizen of heaven, sharing in the delight of angels, and while he gazed on the very beauties which we ourselves gaze upon, rejoicing in them most as the tokens of a present and presiding deity. It were venturing on the region of conjecture to affirm whether, if Adam had not fallen, the earth that we now tread upon would have been the everlasting abode of him and his posterity. But certain it is, 
that man at the first had for his place this world, and at the same time for his privilege an unclouded fellowship with God, and for his prospect in immortality, which death was neither to intercept nor put an end to. He was terrestrial in respect of condition, and yet celestial in respect both of character and enjoyment. His eye looked outwardly on a landscape of earth, while his heart breathed upwardly in the love of heaven. And though he trode the solid platform of our world, and was compassed about with its horizon, still was he within the circle of God's favored creation, and took his place among the freemen and the denizens of the great spiritual commonwealth. This may serve to rectify an imagination, of which we think that all must be conscious, as if the grossness of materialism was only for those who had degenerated into the grossness of sin, and that, when a spiritualizing process had purged away all our corruption, then by the stepping stones of a death and a resurrection, we should be borne away to some ethereal region, where sense and body and all in the shape either of audible sound or of tangible substance were unknown. And hence that strangeness of impression which is felt by you, should the supposition be offered that in the place of eternal blessedness there will be ground to walk upon, or scenes of luxuriance to delight the corporeal senses, or the kindly intercourse of friends talking familiarly, and by articulate converse together, or in short, anything that has the least resemblance to a local territory, filled with various accommodations and peopled over its whole extent by creatures formed like ourselves, having bodies such as we now wear, and faculties of perception, and thought, and mutual communication, such as we now exercise. The common imagination that we have of paradise on the other side of death is that of a lofty aerial region where the inmates float in ether or are mysteriously suspended upon nothing, or all the warm and sensible accompaniments which give such an expression of strength and life and coloring to our present habitation are attenuated into a sort of spiritual element that is meager and imperceptible and utterly uninviting to the eye of mortals here below, where every vestige of materialism is done away, and nothing left but certain unearthly scenes that have no power of allurement, and certain unearthly ecstasies with which it is felt impossible to sympathize. The holders of this imagination forget all the while that really there is no essential connection between materialism and sin, that the world which we now inhabit had all the amplitude and solidity of its present materialism before sin entered into it. That God, so far on that account, from looking slightly upon it, after it had received the last touch of his creating hand, reviewed the earth and the waters and the firmament and all the green herbage with the living creatures and the man whom he had raised in dominion over them, and he saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was all very good. They forget that on the birth of materialism, when it stood out in the freshness of those glories which the great architect of nature had impressed upon it, that then the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. They forgot the appeals that are made everywhere in the Bible to this material workmanship, and how from the face of these visible heavens and the garniture of this earth that we tread upon, the greatness and the goodness of God are reflected on the view of his worshippers. No, my brethren, the object of the administration we sit under is to extirpate sin, but it is not to sweep away materialism. By the convulsions of the last day, it may be shaken and broken down from its present arrangements, and thrown into such fitful agitations as that the whole of its existing framework shall fall to pieces, and with a heat so fervent as to melt its most solid elements, may it be utterly dissolved. And thus may the earth again become without form and void, 
but without one particle of its substance going into annihilation. Out of the ruins of this second chaos may another heaven and another earth be made to arise, and a new materialism, with other aspects of magnificence and beauty, emerge from the wreck of this mighty transformation, and the world be peopled as before with the varieties of material loveliness, and space be again lighted up into a firmament of material splendor. Were our place of everlasting blessedness so purely spiritual, as it is commonly imagined, then the soul of man, after, at death, having quitted his body, would quit it conclusively. That mass of materialism, with which it is associated upon earth, and which many regard as a load and an encumbrance, would have leave to putrefy in the grave, without being revisited by supernatural power, or raised again out of the inanimate dust into which it had resolved. If the body be indeed a clog and a confinement to the spirit, instead of its commodious tenement, then would the spirit feel lightened by the departure it had made, and expatiate in all the buoyancy of its emancipated powers over a scene of enlargement. And this is, doubtless, the prevailing imagination. But why, then, after having made its escape from such a thraldom, should it ever occur to the prison-house of its old materialism, if a prison-house it really be? Why should the disengaged spirit again be fastened to the drag of that grosser and heavier substance, which many think has only the effect of weighing down its activity and infusing into the pure element of mind an ingredient which serves to cloud and to enfeeble it? In other words, what is the use of a day of resurrection if the union which then takes place is to deaden or to reduce all those energies that are commonly ascribed to the living principle in a state of separation? But as a proof of some metaphysical delusion upon this subject, the product, perhaps, of a wrong, though fashionable philosophy, it would appear that to embody the spirit is not the stepping stone to its degradation, but to its preferment. The last day will be a day of triumph to the righteous, because the day of the re-entrance of the spirit to its much-loved abode, or its faculties, so far from being shut up into captivity, will find their free and kindred development in such material organs as are suited to them. The fact of the resurrection proves that, with man at least, the state of a disembodied spirit is a state of unnatural violence, and that the resurrection of his body is an essential step to the highest perfection of which he is susceptible. And it is indeed an homage to that materialism, which many are for expunging from the future state of the universe altogether, that ere the immaterial soul of man has reached the ultimate glory and blessedness which are designed for it, it must return and knock at that very grave where lie the moldered remains of the body which it wore, and their inquisition must be made for the flesh and the sinews and the bones, which the power of corruption has perhaps for centuries before assimilated to the earth that is around them, and there the minute atoms must be reassembled into a structure that bears upon it the form and the lineaments and the general aspect of a man. And the soul passes into this material framework which is hereafter to be its lodging place forever, and that not as its prison, but as its pleasant and befitting habitation, not to be trammeled, as some would have it, in a hold of materialism, but to be therein equipped for the service of eternity, to walk embodied among the bowers of our second paradise, to stand embodied in the presence of our God. There will, it is true, be a change of personal constitution between a good man before his death and a good man after his resurrection. Not, however, that he will be set free from his body, but that he will be set free from the corrupt principle which is in his body. Not that the materialism by which he is now surrounded will be done away, 
but that the taint of evil by which this materialism is now pervaded will be done away. Could this be effected without dying? Then death would be no longer an essential stepping stone to paradise. But it would appear of the moral virus which has been transmitted downwards from Adam and is now spread abroad over the whole human family, it would appear that to get rid of this the old fabric must be taken down and reared anew. And that, not of other materials, but of its own materials, only delivered of all impurity, as if by a refining process in the sepulchre. It is thus that what is sown in weakness is raised in power, and for this purpose it is not necessary to get quit of materialism, but to get quit of sin, and so to purge materialism of its malady. And it is thus that the dead shall come forth incorruptible, and those, we are told, who are alive at this great catastrophe, shall suddenly and mysteriously be changed. While we are compassed about with these vile bodies, as the Apostle emphatically terms them, evil is present, and it is well, if through the working of the Spirit of grace, evil does not prevail. To keep this besetting enemy in check is the task and the trial of our Christianity on earth. And it is the detaching of this poisonous ingredient which constitutes that for which the believer is represented as groaning earnestly, even the redemption of the body that he now wears, and which will then be transformed into the likeness of Christ's glorified body. And this will be his heaven, that he will serve God without a struggle, and in a full gale of spiritual delight, because with the full concurrence of all the feelings and all the faculties of his regenerated nature. Before death, sin is only repressed. After the resurrection, sin will be exterminated. Here, he has to maintain the combat, with a tendency to evil still lodging in his heart, and working a perverse movement among his inclinations. But after his warfare in this world is accomplished, he will no longer be so thwarted, and he will set him down in another world, with the repose and the triumph of victory for his everlasting reward. The great constitutional plague of his nature will no longer trouble him and there will be the charm of a general affinity between the purity of the heart and the purity of the element he breathes in. Still it will not be the purity of spirit escaped from materialism, but of spirit translated into a materialism that has been clarified of evil. It will not be the purity of souls unclothed as at death, but the purity of souls that have again been clothed upon at the resurrection. But the highest homage that we know of to materialism is that which God, manifest in the flesh, has rendered to it. That he, the divinity, should have wrapped his unfathomable essence in one of its coverings and expatiated amongst us in the palpable form and structure of a man, and that he should have chosen such a tenement, not as a temporary abode, but should have borne it with him to the place which he now occupies, and where he is now employed in preparing the mansions of his followers. That he should have entered within the veil, and be now seated at the right hand of the Father, with the very body which was marked by the nails upon his cross, and wherewith he ate and drank after his resurrection. That he who repelled the imagination of his disciples, as if they had seen a spirit, by bidding them handle him and see, and subjecting to their familiar touch the flesh and the bones that encompassed him, that he should now be throned in universal supremacy, and wielding the whole power of heaven and earth, have every knee to bow at his name, and every tongue to confess, and yet all to the glory of God the Father. That humanity, that substantial and embodied humanity, should thus be exalted, and a voice of adoration 
from every creature be lifted up to the Lamb forever and ever? Does this look like the abolition of materialism, after the present system of it is destroyed? Or does it not rather prove that transplanted into another system, it will be a preferred to celestial honors and prolonged in immortality throughout all ages? It has been our careful endeavor, in all that we have said, to keep within the limits of the record, and to offer no other remarks than those which may fitly be suggested by the circumstance that a new earth is to be created, as well as a new heavens, for the future accommodation of the righteous. We have no desire to push the speculation beyond what is written, but it were, at the same time, well that in all our representations of the immortal state there was just the same force of coloring and the same vivacity of scenic exhibition that there is in the New Testament. The imagination of a total and diametric opposition between the region of sense and the region of spirituality certainly tends to abate the interest with which we might otherwise look to the perspective that is on the other side of the grave and to deaden all those sympathies that we else might have with the joys and the exercises of the blessed in paradise. To rectify this, it is not necessary to enter on the particularities of heaven, a topic on which the Bible is certainly most sparing and reserved in its communications. But a great step is gained simply by dissolving the alliance that exists in the mind of many between the two ideas of sin and materialism, or proving that when one's sin is done away, it consists with all we know of God's administration, that materialism shall be perpetuated in the full bloom and vigor of immortality. It altogether holds out a warmer and more alluring picture of the Elysium that awaits us, when told that there will be beauty to delight the eye, and music to regale the ear, and the comfort that springs from all the charities of intercourse between man and man, holding converse as they do on earth, and gladdening each other with the benignant smiles that play on the human countenance, or the accents of kindness that fall in soft and soothing melody from the human voice. there is much of the innocent and much of the inspiring and much to affect and elevate the heart in the scenes and the contemplations of materialism. And we do hail the information of our text that after the dissolution of its present framework it will again be varied and decked out anew in all the graces of its unfading verdure and of its unbounded variety. That in addition to our direct and personal view of the deity when he comes down to tabernacle with men, we shall also have the reflection of him in a lovely mirror of his own workmanship, and that instead of being transported to some abode of dimness and of mystery, so remote from human experience as to be beyond all comprehension, we shall walk forever in a land replenished with those sensible delights and those sensible glories, which we doubt not will lie most profusely scattered over the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. But though a paradise of sense, it will not be a paradise of sensuality. Though not so unlike the present world as many apprehend it, there will be one point of total dissimilarity betwixt them. It is not the entire substitution of spirit for matter that will distinguish the future economy from the present, but it will be the entire substitution of righteousness for sin. It is this which signalizes the Christian from the Mahometan paradise. Not that sense and substance and splendid imagery and the glories of a visible creation seen with bodily eyes are excluded from it, but that all which is vile in principle or voluptuous in impurity will be utterly excluded from it. There will be a firm earth as we have at present and a heaven stretched over it as we have at present and it is not by the absence of these, but by the absence of sin, that the abodes of immortality will be characterized. 
there will both be heavens and earth, it would appear, in the next great administration, and with this specialty to mark it from the present one, that it will be a heavens and an earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, though the first topic of information that we adduced from the text may be regarded as not very practical, yet the second topic on which we now insist is most eminently so. Were it the great characteristic of that spirituality which is to obtain in a future heaven that it was a spirituality of essence, then occupying and pervading the place from which materialism had been swept away, we could not by any possible method approximate the condition we are in at present to the condition we are to hold everlastingly. We cannot etherealize the matter that is around us, neither can we attenuate our own bodies, nor bring down the slightest degree of such a heaven to the earth that we now inhabit. But when we are told that materialism is to be kept up, and that the spirituality of our future state lies not in the kind of substance which is to compose its framework, but in the character of those who people it, this puts, if not the fullness of heaven, at least a foretaste of heaven within our reach. We have not to strain at a thing so impracticable as that of diluting the material economy which is without us. We have only to reform the moral economy that is within us. We are now walking on a terrestrial surface, not more compact, perhaps, than the one we shall hereafter walk upon, and are now wearing terrestrial bodies not firmer and more solid, perhaps, than those we shall hereafter wear. It is not by working any change upon them that we could realize, to any extent, our future heaven. And this is simply done by opening the door of our heart for the influx of heaven's affections by bringing the whole man as made up of soul and spirit and body, under the presiding authority of heaven's principles. This will make plain to you how it is, that it could be said in the New Testament, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and how in that book its place is marked out, not by locally pointing to any quarter, and saying, Lo, here or lo, there, but by the simple affirmation that the kingdom of heaven is within you. And how in defining what it was that constituted the kingdom of heaven, there is an enumeration, not of such circumstances as make up an outward condition, but of such feelings and qualities as make up a character. Even righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And how the ushering in of the new dispensation is held equivalent to the introduction of this kingdom into the world, all making it evident that if the purity and the principles of heaven begin to take effect upon our heart, what is essentially heaven begins with us, even in this world. That instead of ascending to some upper region for the purpose of entering it, it may descend upon us and make an actual entrance of itself into our bosoms. And that so far, therefore, from that remote and inaccessible thing which many do regard it, it may, through the influence of the word which is nigh unto you, and of the spirit that is given to prayer, be lighted up in the inner man of an individual upon earth, whose person may even here exemplify its graces, and whose joy may even here realize a measure of its enjoyments. And hence, one great purpose of the incarnation of our Savior. He came down amongst us in the full perfection of heaven's character, and has made us see that it is a character which may be embodied. All its virtues were, in his case, infused into a corporeal framework, and the substance of these lower regions was taken into intimate and abiding association with the spirit of the higher. The ingredient which is heavenly admits of being united with the ingredient which is earthly, so that we, who by nature are of the earth and earthly, could we catch of that pure and celestial element which made the man Christ Jesus to differ from all other men? Then might we too be formed into that character by which it is that the members of the family above differ from those of the outcast family beneath. 
Now it is expressly said of him that he is set before us as an example. And we are required to look to that living exhibition of him, where all the graces of the upper sanctuary are beheld as in a picture. And instead of an abstract, we have in his history a familiar representation of such worth and piety and excellence, as could they only be stamped upon our own persons and borne along with us to the place where he now dwelleth. Instead of being shunned as aliens, we should be welcomed and recognized as seemly companions for the inmates of that place of holiness. And, in truth, the great work of Christ's disciples upon earth is a constant and busy process of assimilation to their Master, who is in heaven. And we live under a special economy that has been set up for the express purpose of helping it forward. It is for this in particular that the Spirit is provided. We are changed into the image of the Lord, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Nursed out of this fullness, we grow up unto the stature of perfect men in Christ Jesus. And instead of heaven being a remote and mysterious unknown, heaven is brought near to us by the simple expedient of inspiring us where we now stand, with its love and its purity and its sacredness. We learn from Christ that the heavenly graces are all of them compatible with the wear of an earthly body and the circumstances of an earthly habitation. It is not said in how many of its features the new earth will differ from, or be like unto the present one. But we, by turning from our iniquities unto Christ, push forward the resemblance of the one to the other, in the only feature that is specified, even that therein dwelleth righteousness. And had we only the character of heaven, we should not be long of feeling what that is which essentially makes the comfort of heaven. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest iniquity. Therefore God thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Let us but love the righteousness which he loves, and hate the iniquity which he hateth. And this, of itself, would so soften and attune the mechanism of our moral nature that in all the movements of it there should be joy. It is not sufficiently adverted to that the happiness of heaven lies simply and essentially in the well-going machinery of a well-conditioned soul, and that according to its measure it is the same in kind with the happiness of God, who liveth forever in bliss ineffable, because he is unchangeable in being good and upright and holy. There may be audible music in heaven, but its chief delight will be in the music of well-poised affections, and of principles in full and consenting harmony with the laws of eternal rectitude. There may be visions of loveliness there, but it will be the loveliness of virtue, as seen directly in God, and as reflected back again in family likeness from all his children. It will be this that shall give its purest and sweetest transports to the soul. In a word, the main reward of paradise is spiritual joy, and that springing at once from the love and the possession of spiritual excellence. It is such a joy as sin extinguishes on the moment of its entering the soul, and such a joy as is again restored to the soul, and that immediately on its being restored to righteousness. It is thus that heaven may be established upon earth, and the petition of our Lord's prayer be fulfilled, Thy kingdom come. This petition receives its best explanation from the one which follows, Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. It just requires a similarity of habit and character in the two places to make out a similarity of enjoyment. Let us attend, then, to the way in which the services of the upper sanctuary are rendered, not in the spirit of legality, for this gendereth to bondage, but in the spirit of love, which gendereth to the beatitude of the affections rejoicing in their best and most favorite indulgence. They do not work there, 
for the purpose of making out the conditions of a bargain. They do not act agreeably to the pleasure of God in order to obtain the gratification of any distinct will or distinct pleasure of their own in return for it. Their will is, in fact, identical with the will of God. There is a perfect unison of taste and of inclination between the creature and the Creator. They are in their element when they are feeling righteously and doing righteously. Obedience is not a drudgery, but delight to them. And as much as there is of the congenial between animal nature and the food that is suitable to it, so much is there of the congenial between the moral nature of heaven and its sacred employments and services. Let the will of God, then, be done here, as it is done there, and not only will character and conduct be the same here as there, but they will also resemble each other in the style, though not in the degree, of their blessedness. The happiness of heaven will be exemplified upon earth, along with the virtue of heaven. For in truth the main ingredient of that happiness is not given them in payment for work, but it lies in the love they bear to the work itself. A man is never happier than when employed in that which he likes best. This is all a question of taste. But should such a taste be given as to make it a man's meat and drink to do the will of his father, then is he in perfect readiness for being carried upwards to heaven and placed beside the pure river of water of life that proceedeth out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is the way in which you make a heaven upon earth not by heaping your reluctant offers at the shrine of legality, but by serving God because you love him, and doing his will because you delight to do him honor. And here we may remark that the only possible conveyance for this new principle into the heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That in no other way than through the acceptance of its free pardon, sealed by the blood of an atonement, which exalts the lawgiver, can the soul of man be both emancipated from the fear of terror and solemnized into the fear of humble and holy reverence, that it is only in conjunction with the faith that justifies that the love of gratitude and the love of moral esteem are made to arise in the bosom of regenerated man, and therefore to bring down the virtues of heaven as well as the peace of heaven into this lower world we know not what else can be done than to urge upon you the great propitiation of the New Testament. Nor are we aware of any expedient by which all the cold and freezing sensations of legality can be done away, but by your thankful and unconditional acceptance of Jesus Christ and Him crucified.